Hello, everybody. We um, still have a few people logging in, so we're going to give you a couple of seconds to get settled and we'll soon uh, get underway. Just a few more seconds. Okay, I think we, we should be ready to go. Uh, hello again. Um, we have uh, almost um, over 400 guests from um, around 41 countries joining us today for um, our in-session talk, Another World is Possible. Before introducing you to our esteemed guests, Jeff and Clive, uh, please allow me to cover uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Today's webinar uh, is being recorded. We will be able to share a link uh, to the recording um, at some point after the event next week. Uh, we also invite you to ask questions by using the Q&A function on your Zoom screen. Um, please um, use the chat button if you have any technical difficulties regarding the webinar. Uh, also, we aim to have a very interactive session today and we will introduce polls during um, the talk and you will be able to submit your answers uh, online. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jeff and Clive. I'm going to hand you over to Clive, who is going to start today's conversation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Royal College of Art in session event. I'm absolutely delighted to be welcoming Jeff Morgan. Just quickly say hello, Jeff. How are you doing? Hi there. Quite cold. Otherwise, really good. <laughs> <laughs> Heating down, hey? <laughs> yes. Well, thanks again for joining us. Jeff has been at a couple of our open innovation events and is very much a friend of the course, spoken some of our student events, and uh, I'm really delighted he's, he's come here to join us today. Uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction uh, to, to Jeff for some of those who are perhaps not so familiar or um, don't know the detail behind Jeff, someone who I feel has had a major impact on my life. Um, uh, I am uh, Professor Clive Grinier, by the way, I can't remember if I uh, announced my name at the beginning of this, uh, and I am the Head of Service Design here at the Royal College of Art, and I'm particularly excited that Jeff is here because there feels a very close connection between Jeff's impact on my life, on, on British life, actually, and the work we are trying to do here in service design at the Royal College of Art. And that's something we'll be exploring in our conversation. But um, first of all, introducing Jeff in a little bit more detail. He comes from a science background. He's a fellow of MIT. As, as a, a younger man, he drove a van for Billy Bragg and Jimmy Somerville and the, uh, the emerging new labor movement and the comedians and actors who supported it. He was an academic and a writer, a journalist with The Independent, the FT, and worked for the BBC amongst others, but became a writer on social and political issues that took him to founding what for me was in my consciousness, one of the first think tanks, Demos, in the 90s, Demos that looked um, at, at social and political issues is still going strong, I think. Um, I was a co-founder of that, became a political advisor for Gordon Brown and, and a part of that new Labour movement that took him into the strategy unit and director of policy at number 10 Downing Street, which was the precursor of the UK uh, cabinet office was the head of the Young Foundation, uh, a wonderful organization started by Michael Young, who is famous for a number of things, including the, the um, invention of the Open University and the University of the Third Age and many other things. Um, became the CEO of Nesta, the UK National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts that was opened uh, by David Putnam back in the days of the New Labour Project and now just known as Nesta. Uh, an organization for social change and innovation. And the final part of his journey, he's now Professor of Collective Intelligence, Public Policy and Social Innovation at University College London, otherwise known as UCL. And at that point, I'm, Jeff, I'm going to ask you, could you explain a little bit about what that role is, please? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> yeah, yes. well, I, I, my career is kind of oscillated between working top down so I work a lot with governments still 
and sort of bottom up working with startups or community projects or social enterprises. I'm now based in an engineering department. And I one of the things I love about engineering is it just sort of does stuff <laughs> and it either works or it doesn't. Uh, and working on the boundary of science, technology and public policy is the part of UCL I'm in. Um, we work quite a bit on evidence, helping governments and others make sense of evidence, whether on mental health or net zero, which we'll come on to later. And then I have a side strand working on collective intelligence. I've become increasingly convinced there's a new science, a new discipline of how you organize thought at large scale, often helped by the internet or AI and so on. And it's not yet really mature, but I think in 10, 20 years time, it will be absolutely part of mainstream uh, life. And then out of my base in UCL, probably thanks to lockdowns, uh, <laughs> I became more and more obsessed with imagination and the problems of imagination that led to the book, which is part of our title today, which came out last year, Another World is Possible. <laughs> and then this week, uh, actually in physical form, another book more on art uh -huh. and the role of art in social imagination, which I literally came into my hands um, a couple of days ago. Very good. So, a slightly kind of confused uh, role I have, but uh, hopefully it's a healthy confusion. I think that confusion and fuzziness is why we wanted you to talk to us, because I think we probably all feel the same. And obviously here at the Royal College of Art, we're combining art and design mm. to to do something that I think you're, you know, you have done a lot of. And the book is is uh, in front of me as well. And as you can see, it's full of post-its. Um, it's an incredible book, and I think one incredibly relevant to a design audience, but obviously much wider as well, um, called Another World is Possible, How to Reignite Social and Political Imagination. And if I can just read very briefly, I mean, I could probably spend most of this hour just reading my favorite bits, but I'm not gonna do that or asking you to read it. But you say this is a book about imagination, it's focus, isn't imagination in the arts and sciences or the imaginative worlds of fiction and poetry. Instead, it's about how we might imagine a better society, one with less unhappiness, poverty, violence, and ecological harm. I know all these things are incredibly important to you as a first step to make it happen. Why this book and, and why now? The, the real prompt for writing it came a little bit before the pandemic when I spent quite a lot of time with, with activists uh, mainly ecological activists in the Friday school strike movement and started asking them about their pictures of the future. That prompted me then to in interview quite a lot of business leaders and political leaders and pretty much everyone, everywhere I found the same same pattern. And it may be true of all of you on this, this, this event or not, we'll find out. People found it very easy to picture, literally picture ecological disaster in the near future, the world burning up, systems collapsing, hunger, uh, and so on. They found it quite easy to picture technological futures, a world of drones and AI and robots, and Hollywood helps us with both of those. But almost no one could picture what might happen to our, our, our democracy or our welfare system. And as an example, I spent some of this morning with the people who help run the care system in the UK. You know, what could care for the elderly look like when you know, maybe you and me are going into homes? There was seemed to be a void there. And I became convinced this is actually quite a big problem for a society that doesn't have a sense of what's possible, plausible, desirable, mm -hmm. a generation or two into the future. Fantastic. Now, I think you raise a good point there. And in the in the beginning of your book, you took about the, talk about the very dystopian natures of our visions of the future. We've got a bit of a poll uh, mm -hmm. capability here on this on this uh, webinar. So um, I'd very much like to ask everybody a question, just a very simple question about your feeling for the future. Jeff mentioned dystopia and these these visions of climate apocalypse but how optimistic do people feel right now at the beginning of this talk anyway um would you say you are optimistic about the future very not sure or not very optimistic in fact possibly even pessimistic so um do i hope you can see this in front of you now do put your vote in um we're going to keep talking but we'll come back to this and get a measure for how optimistic everybody feels um, by the way, I see on the chat that somebody felt they couldn't see me. I'm hoping that everyone can see me now. And I'll be looking at the questions as they come in. And later on, we'll be taking some of those questions live with, with Jeff. Thank you. Great. So um, one of the things I really enjoyed in your book was 
was your explanation of why we need to have uh, positive views of the future. And one word you used that really interested me was resilience. Uh, and you talk about societies. Well, let me ask you, you know, why do you feel social imagination, creativity, perhaps in, in imagining positive futures? You know, why does that give us resilience? I think it partly gives us resilience, but it gives us more than that. The bit about resilience partly came from rereading the amazing work half a century ago by Viktor Frankl on concentration camp survivors, oh. <laughs> uh, which was very influential work and basically showed the people who were most likely to survive this appalling experience were the ones who had some sense of hope, who kept hope alive that they might get out, they might have a future, etc. And this turned out to be really important for their physical health as well as their mental health uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so I think resilience is part of it, but it's also just about a sense of direction. And I think this applies in our own lives, in our mm. families, in our towns, in our societies. If you don't have any sense of where you might be going, where you might want to go, you know, if you don't in your own life have a picture of you know, what how you, you might be five years from now, it's quite hard to plan. It's quite hard to do things. It's quite hard to have a sense of of agency in, in the present. And so this is why I think imagination in, in, as I say, every aspect of our lives from homes to relationships to societies is part of what helps us to thrive uh, as humans. And perhaps particularly if you're buffeted by crises and we are in the midst of a whole series of overlapping crises, economic, political, ecological, uh, military war crisis, um, in a way, the risk is that just so crushes our sense of possibility, our horizons narrow down, and we don't really do anything <laughs> to care for posterity or for the future, our own or those of our children. Uh, because there is perhaps a sense of, of defeatism or cynicism. And as you say, you know, Hollywood will make dystopia and, and our headlines are terrible at the moment. It, how do we overcome those barriers to thinking more positively about the future? What do you think? Are the, uh, are the, how do we get over that, especially in this time of crisis? Mm. Well, we, we'll see what comes back from the poll in a moment. Yes, but in, yes we will. In, in many countries, this a survey is done, essentially asking people, do you expect your children to live a better life than you will be better off? And in much of the world, the answers are negative. Pretty much all of Europe and North America, large majorities now expect things to be worse from their children than them. Is not true in sub-Saharan Africa, it's not true in China, not true in India. So there's an uneven global pattern in terms of hope. Um, but one of the things I point out in the book is we might have hoped <laughs> that those parts of the world would be offering, as it were, imaginative visions to the rest of the world, which we could draw on. And to some extent, China does show all sorts of possibilities of the future, very you know, data-driven, technocratic, but it's not a particularly appealing uh, vision to, uh, to someone like me. Uh, Modi in India presents, again, his version of a very Hindu uh, future, uh, a very particular notion of science and tech, but again, it's not that appealing to the rest of us. So what I try and focus on, and this is maybe where, you know, where institutions like the RCA become important, I think we need institutions to actually systematically work on helping us to imagine alternatives to the future. And that has to bring in the arts and design uh, and all sorts of methods of curating, because the, the institution which might have done that in the past, including political parties, social movements and others, have largely vacated this space. So we have a gap where uh, work on imagination should be happening. That's right. You talk interestingly about, you know, things like the, the literary works like Utopia itself, the original Thomas More vision of where we were going. I think you're right. Design and art is absolutely about creating those visions. But we sometimes really worry, A, that we're not taking seriously, um, uh, and B, how do we deliver? It's no point only imagining something. Uh, how do we actually deliver it? You've been in policy. You've had successful and unsuccessful attempts at changing the world. What do you think we need to do to, to help the world take our vision seriously? I think design does have a much bigger role than it had 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, I, I work with the different, you know, 50, 60 governments around the world in the last two or three years, and many of them using elements of design, particularly I think attention to lived experience is taken much more seriously than it was. Uh, 
Mm. The idea of, of prototyping uh, rather than moving straight to sort of national laws and programs. Yeah. The idea of experimentation is much more common than it used to be. So some aspects of the design mentality, I think, are more present. I think the biggest challenge for designers, and one which I tried to address in both of these books, is what I call materiality bias. In a way, it's easiest to imagine through things you can see or touch, through yeah. objects and yeah. etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, and yet this is in some ways part of our problem that we can easily picture technological futures, as I say, robots, drones, AI, new kinds yeah. of uh, vehicle or, or home or whatever. But so much of a real society is immaterial. It's about relationships. It's about consciousness, how you think and feel. And design has been, I think, often good at talking about that, but it is much harder, as it were, to, to show that, to embody it. So one of the challenges I would almost throw to the next generation of designers is how do you work both with the material and physical and the immaterial to help people imagine not just the stuff around us, but as I say, future consciousness. And some of the most exciting questions of this century are really about how we, as I say, how we think and feel, as well as about, you know, what a hyperloop may be, or, um, you know, how yeah. we'll have, uh, you know, um, synthetic biology meat or whatever. I think you raise a, a fascinating point. And someone who used to be a product designer, but is now a service designer, I feel I'm very much designing the invisible bits. And, and you mentioned AI, actually, in your introduction, you know, we see AI as something that has such power, um, but so many problems. We've all been, you know, focusing on the ethical and bias problems of AI, which, after all, is only learning from previous history and the future. But you seem quite optimistic about AI, and you talked about it in your role. What do we need to do to make sure that we are engaged in the development of those sorts of technologies? These invisible enablers, as I call them. Well, I actually think we've we've substantially failed on AI <laughs> as we did on the internet. <laughs> And yes. I write a little bit in the book on how extraordinary it was that the internet became part of everybody's life 20, 30 years ago. And it was really only in the last five or 10 years that serious attention turned to what this might be doing to childhood or to democracy or to misinformation. There wasn't even really a place for that discussion. We had no institutions. Almost no governments had laws about the internet and the internet pioneers were very adamant there shouldn't be any laws or any regulations. And so this extraordinarily transformative technology has been so allowed to run slightly rampant, both for good and ill. And I think the same is a bit happening with, with AI. It's literally only in the 2020s, we're getting the new legal frameworks in the EU and in China, the US a little bit uh, behind for regulating AI. A few years ago, I did a I wrote a blueprint for what an AI regulator could look like. This was about six or seven years ago. Yes. The yes. UK did actually set something up very similar, uh, the, the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. So in some ways, we are a bit of a yeah. trailblazer. At least there is an institution which is looks at things like facial recognition and targeted advertising, their ethics, their practicalities, and so on. And in my last job at Nesta, we ran various funds commissioning AI for education or for jobs or in healthcare, but these were tiny compared to the money going into AI for the military or for the intelligence agencies, the NSA, GCHQ, or in business. Amazon now spends $40 billion a year on R&D, which is twice as much as the entire UK public budget. So there's a massive imbalance as between, say, AI for killing people or for selling things versus AI for health, education, welfare, you name it. And I think this is a deep sort of structural imbalance in our societies, which causes all sorts of problems. Very, very interesting. I mean, I would also say another problem I have with design is we keep waiting to be invited to the party. We need to be a bit more proactive about getting involved. But I'm um, just going to pause there because we did set that little poll up earlier on. Joe, do we have any results of our poll? So people are, by and large, either neutral or not very optimistic. A gallant, 21%. That must be all the designers on the call because <laughs> designers are inherently optimistic that we can make it better. But, um, yeah, I think that, that that doesn't surprise me. I guess, does it surprise you, Jeff? <laughs> Well, not really. There's quite a lot to be pessimistic about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we do have an unfolding um, climate crisis. 
we have had in the last 12 months the biggest hit to people's living standards in anyone can remember so yeah these are difficult times for many people I think one of my before we move on to um, some of your work in zero carbon, a, a great challenge that is, I think one of my um, favorite case studies of crisis is, you know, that during COVID, we created the uh, world class test and trace system turned out not to be partly because it's so appallingly designed. And if ever you want a you know, reason to have more service design in the world. But of course, the government doesn't ring me up and say, can we have some service designers? <laughs> Again, we, we can't wait to be invited. We need to advertise what we do. But I know, Jeff, that your passion around um, zero carbon has been running for a long time. Now, there is a huge challenge there. And in, in the midst of all these other crises, how do we keep people's attention on that? Now, how do, what do you think the, the road to zero carbon is looking like? What's its health like at the moment? Well, it's, it's very complex and very contradictory. <laughs> Um, so, I, as you say, I first got involved in sort of circular economy, decarbonisation things about 30 years ago, and I definitely wasn't one of the mm. first, there were many people yeah. already working on them. Mm. And I think this is a topic where one needs the right balance of optimism and pessimism. Uh, so one thing I often ask people, we won't do it as a poll, is, you know, what do you think the UK has managed in terms of reducing carbon emissions, let's say, since the year 2000? Or, you know, how well have we done at recycling paper or glass? And I find even very well-informed audiences haven't a clue. <laughs> I mean, maybe all of you on this call know the answer. it's quite good, answers. isn't it? Aren't, good? Aren't we quite good? In relation to carbon emissions, we're down about 50%. Oh. Even 40% of you include imports, which surprises most people. Most yeah, people think it's gone up. Yeah. We recycle across Europe something like three quarters of paper, you mm. know, from almost zero a generation ago. Mm. So these there are some surprisingly good examples of how over quite long periods of time, dramatic change can be achieved in systems. And I think it's really important we celebrate those successes because otherwise we feed a fatalism, which makes people think nothing is possible. It's all yeah. you know, built into the system. It's too difficult to change things. But of course, we have far further to go and many countries are seeing emissions still rising and one of the interesting things happening everywhere now is much more detailed work on the roadmaps which take us from here to 2040 2050 which does mean transforming your your you know the big hitters like transport moving uh further away from obviously cars and too much air travel towards trains and evs and so on with countries like norway right in the lead it does mean changing our energy mix uh maybe 20 years time we will all have heat pumps outside our our, our homes uh much more use of solar we already have you know half of electricity coming from renewables which is isn't bad compared to the two or three percent we were uh when i first worked on this uh, topic but we will also need you know change of pretty much every institution we have of our tax of our regulations of our companies and of of ourselves so you know a little um example I sometimes well, it's a kind of obvious example is a, a kilo of beef produces about 60 kilos of greenhouse gas emissions a kilo of peas produces about one kilo of greenhouse gas emissions and that's regardless if it's local or not and so obviously we have to dramatically transform our, our eating habits if we're going to you know uh, uh, seriously attend to climate change and the good news though I think is to say the reason there has been success in the last 20 years certainly in countries like the UK or the Scandinavians is really a, a sort of coalition of designers engineers scientists activists social movements and then some politicians some civil servants becoming part of that movement and together steadily pushing the necessary changes in australia where i was a couple of weeks ago they were missing crucial parts of that coalition particularly <laughs> in politics which meant they wasted 10 years, even while they were facing these extraordinary uh, bushfires. Climate change is much more present, much more damaging in Australia than here, but they didn't have the right coalition. And so they are still like Canada and the US, one of the worst polluting, one of the worst emitting countries on the planet. No, that's absolutely amazing. So I love your optimism there. This uh, And you, you paint a much more positive picture than perhaps most people expect. You know, is there an issue with our media as well, especially in the UK, but probably all over the world? Are we are we just 
um, disassociated from positive messages because of perhaps that cynicism in, in people in society. We're definitely not very good at telling the stories about good changes. Mm. Um, and again, there are many reasons. For this. Our media probably will always focus on the dramatic, the negative. That's partly how our brains are wired. But again, this is where I think institutions should be playing a part. Almost no institutions tell this story of carbon reductions, because if you're a if you're a climate activist, you don't want to make it sound too easy. So you want to emphasize the bad. Uh, and if you're a politician, you don't want to give credit to your predecessors who might have brought in the necessary laws and regulations. So there's a weird absence of anyone wanting to tell these stories. And on social policy, which I worked on a lot, you know, we we achieved quite dramatic changes on things like street homelessness went down yes. about 80, 90 percent or teenage pregnancy was halved or the gap between the poorest estates and the average greatly reduced. But again, these happen over 10 or 20 years, yeah. not over one or two years. And we seem to struggle as a society to tell these somewhat longer term stories, many of which are are pretty positive. No, I like that. And, and, and that's music, I think, to some of my students is we do a lot of work with people like the big issue, mm. um, you know, and, and change happens. How do, how do you digitize the experience of the big issue when no one's got cash anymore and nobody wants a magazine? You know, mm. these are these are new problems that keep coming around old ones. And we do a lot of work in with prisons, with probation mm. service as well. I think you've done some some work in that area. Um, mm. And actually, one of the things post COVID is, is I might observe that the speed of changes has, has sped up. Actually, people seem to be. Would you would you concur with that? Are you seeing a sort of more haste and desire for new ideas post COVID? I'm not sure. So, okay. just to give one example, education. You're an educational institution. I work in one. There was the fastest change ever in human history happened worldwide to schools and universities in March 2020. They all had to go online suddenly. <laughs> you know, the entire system was changed in ways which had, people like you had been talking about for years, and it then suddenly happened and, uh, and, and lasted a couple of years. We did a big study on the global experiences of education in lockdown, which were quite surprising. I mean, it was not great for many kids by any means, and many dropped out in many countries, but for some children, it was actually better than what went before. There was some clear innovation in teaching methods or parental engagement, which were probably better. And yet almost everywhere, everyone has reverted back to what they were doing before the pandemic. Very little of that incredible wealth of, of innovation has been sort of re-embedded into normal practice. And I, I hear that in quite a few fields. Maybe people were so desperate to see the end of the pandemic, they're just desperate to return, return. to normality. But we, we, we've wasted, I say, an incredible amount of creativity during the crisis. Uh, and just before Christmas, I, 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 was, I published a, a survey we did of how governments and societies around the world had handled their intelligence through the crisis with mm. extraordinary examples from mm. Korea and Taiwan and India and so on. But I don't see much appetite in you know, Whitehall in England and elsewhere to actually learn from those lessons mm. to just to do things differently. We have a bit too much inertia in my mind. <laughs> mm. So that's 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 our shared problem there, isn't it? How do we transform complex systems and take them forward? And you you started to talk a little bit there about collaboration, and you've got a you've got a really interesting quote right towards the end of your book. Actually, I'm just going to touch on briefly. You say, "Who ultimately needs social imagination?" The answer is, we all do. We need to become more engaged. John Dewey argued that every political project needs to create the public that can be its author. I thought that was a very striking quote perhaps you could illuminate a little bit on your thoughts about that well in a way that's what you know the ecological movement has has done is to create a public which thinks of itself as having a duty to future generations um there's a very interesting example which i i mention in in, in the book in wales which created six years ago a future generations act a future generations commissioner and other countries are now thinking of copying that, including Ireland and Scotland. And that's a way, in some, another way of kind of creating a public who can be the author of a more forward-looking uh, approach to things. Many countries have committees of the future in parliaments, which again sort of play that role. They become self-conscious 
as the guardians, the curators, the shapers of a, of a, of a, of a desirable future. But without that kind of author, everything gets pushed back to the present and to the silos. And I might just briefly mention here a, a project I just started in the last month for the European Union, which is looking at what's called whole of government innovation. How do you get the whole of a government, yes. all its different ministries and agencies and regulators to actually work together on something like um, net zero or artificial intelligence? How do we overcome all of those very powerful forces which block collaboration? And I'm actually next week publishing a paper on this, looking at past experiences like wars, often when there was a truly existential threat, you know, everyone did pull together and extraordinary things were possible. And there are plenty of good examples from the last 50 or 60 years, but we need to make those more part of the everyday normality. Yes. In the case of the old silos. Yeah, yeah very nice. You, you have a great Chinese proverb, when the wind of change blows, some build walls, others build windmills, <laughs> which I love very much. Um, but also you mentioned earlier on about experimentation and prototyping, which is which is something I always feel um, politics and, and organizations are very poor at. We love to solutionize very quickly and then and fail slowly. Um, and um, you, you talk about somewhere like Wales where they're, they're looking at something on a smaller, is that part of how we use our imagination to actually deliver change where we try things in small areas and see if they work and learn and iterate and learn by failure at a small level but I do perceive organizations are reluctant to do that. But I did send you the guarding article the other day where they said, we did all that stuff in COVID that was experimentation and it really worked. Why don't we do that in policy? I thought that was a, an interesting yeah. pointer to a different way. So it was a really nice article, uh, Clive, sent me by Stephen Westlake, who used to be a, uh, I used to work with over many years and he's now just become actually head of the ESRC, the Economic and Social Research Council. Uh, and he was making the case for experimentation I think there's a legitimate view that in the 20th century, imagination sometimes meant a bunch of people in a capital city or in a political party designing a blueprint, which they then imposed on the society, often rather disastrously. <laughs> and I think we're trying to shift to a completely different mindset where you do set broad directions, let's say to a zero carbon society or greatly reducing inequality, but you use small scale rapid experiment to find out how to do that well. Stian mentions in that piece the really interesting example of the rapid experiments on COVID treatments, mm. which the UK did very effectively in 2020, 21, 22. There's quite a few governments around the world now committing themselves to experiment as a matter of course. Justin Trudeau did in Canada, the Finnish government is, uh, is one, and, and in UK there's, a, there's various uh, bits in my last job at Nesta, we had the Innovation Growth Lab using randomized controlled trials for business support. The Behavioral Insights team does it around uh, behavioral insights, not surprisingly. Uh, and, uh, and we're seeing more and more of these. And I, I like to quote, as we are in a sort of deep crisis now, um, FDR, Roosevelt, who yeah. was elected president in mm. the US in 1932, and in his inaugural speech basically said, yes, of course, we will experiment. We will try things. Some of them will fail, yeah. but we will then admit it and move on to the next one. But that's part of what leadership is in a crisis, is a willingness to try things, to take risks. And I wish we had a few more political leaders with that courage, essentially. And Roosevelt was elected four times. So it was not it was not exactly bad for his political career. You can do it if you're a politician, but I think if, if sometimes the stature of our politicians is too small. They feel they have to say everything they do works and they can't admit failure. We need bigger politicians who can embrace change in the way that Roosevelt did. And even well, people like Michael Bloomberg, when he was mayor of New York, was very committed to experiment and innovation and famously said that if one of his managers experimented with something and it failed, not because of mismanagement, but just failed, he would take them for dinner as a, as a signal that he, he actually wanted people to take risks. <laughs> ah, I love stories like that. Um, FDR, Ronald Reagan's hero, apparently, I learned the other day. Who knew that? <laughs> Very unexpected hero for Ronnie Reagan. Um, are you raised leadership? That's such an interesting topic. We could have another another event on that, I'm sure. But um, it's very interesting what you say about 
the political pressure our leaders are under we see that happening especially at this time you know whether it's trying to stop migrant boats i don't want to wander too much into politics except as a sort of force for good um but also this aspect of leadership uh do, do people's expectations of leadership understand that they should allow their leaders to accept failure is that part of the problem we have here I think if you, if you have a, a, an honest dialogue with the public um, and you say, look, I'm trying 20 different things and hopefully five of them will work and 15 won't, but we'll try them quickly and shut them when they don't work. The public will just say, oh, that's obvious. That's just, that's sensible. That's mm. what is normal in science. That is what's normal in medicine, is what's normal in business. If you are a Google or a Meta, you're automatically A, B, A, B, C, test everything. I just think we haven't had politicians who've tried in this generation to make that argument. And those that have, like Trudeau and so on, have, have basically mm. got away with it. And people think that's just a mature way to do to do government. Um, you may get, you know, hum harassed in the Daily Mail if one of your pilots fails, but just ignore them. You know? <laughs> they they <laughs> won't matter next week. We need more resilience ourselves. I think that's yeah. uh, that's yeah. possibly true. And in a you know, we, we we teach a lot about user testing and things like that, but sometimes not even the users, right? Of course, though. that's a dangerous thing to say. But we have to have more imagination. We have to have more more vision. Are you are you optimistic for the future, Jeff? Before we come to perhaps some of the questions we've got here, uh, it depends what day of the week. But, um, <laughs> I'm probably congenitally optimistic. <laughs> Um, in the long run, I'm not very optimistic in the short run. I think we have a very difficult few years ahead. I'm not optimistic about geopolitics. I think there probably will be, we are probably in another time of, of wars and, uh, and tensions. But I guess my, my encouragement to anyone is I think the easiest way to become pessimistic is by really standing back from the world and just looking at it through a screen or through news feeds. I think the more engaged you are in doing stuff in the world, that tends to feed hope and optimism and the people I find most pessimistic are usually the ones who don't really do anything who just literally are, are, are passive observers so if you're feeling pessimistic if you're one of the people who the 44 percent or whatever in our poll I'd say just just do get it get involved in stuff in your community in your society wherever it may be that's a good uh, antidote yeah. to excessive pessimism that's 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 fantastic I must admit you know I'm very lucky in my life because I'm surrounded by organizations that come to the course looking for solutions yes. because they want to make the world better. Mm. My view is lovely. Don't look at Twitter, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, I'm going to pick up some of the questions. We've got some votes here. Um, and uh, I'm going to look at some of the, uh, I'm going to, I can't read all of them out, but I'm going to read one here, which I, I strikes me as interesting. Uh, first of all, a vital discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul Hackett. Um, in imagining a better future, does Sir Jeff see room for employers and business to take a more proactive role in empowering a healthier society? That is to make well-being driven as vital as best practice as sustainability and quality and net zero. Interesting question, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's a short answer. I mean, on, on net zero, the leading companies who've committed themselves to very demanding targets and really rethought every aspect of their supply chains, their manufacturing, have in some respects gone far ahead of, uh, of any governments and they are role models. Um, a lot of the German companies I find particularly impressive on that. Uh, and then on a completely different topic, I mentioned earlier, I, I do quite a lot of work around mental health and well-being, and last at the end of last year we published a big sort of global systematic review on population level mental health what do you do if you're trying to improve the mental health of 30 40 percent of the population not just the one or two percent with really acute needs as soon as you face a topic like that it's obvious employers have more everyday interaction with the people you're interested in than the nhs does or or, or local doctors so the whole question of what should employers do there are mental health first aiders, there are all sorts of programs, there's all sorts of policies. Um, I, I wrote a paper a couple of years ago, which the World Economic Forum published on collective mental health and how employers might think about it, measure it, support it. Um, and there are many examples like that where almost structurally, the business sector is a bigger player than government and therefore has to be 
uh, part of has to be on the forefront of showing what's possible. Uh, um, and hopefully they, as with experiments, showing on a moderate scale. So the rest of the economy and society then can then copy on a, on a larger scale. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I certainly have always been surprised at how innovative and caring big business can be. Actually, we always see it as a, as a very negative thing, profit driven thing. But there are some some uh, behaviours and practices, especially around mental health, that perhaps the government could really learn from <laughs> at the moment. Um, let's have a look at a couple of other questions. Uh, there's a question here from Serge Isakoff. What are your recommendations regarding balancing developing an optimistic perspective and creating the impetus to change the world so that we don't just dream of a positive future, but act to make it reality, bridge the intention action gap? I know we do a lot of projects on, you know, Gen Zs and millennials who say they want to do good, but actually they don't. <laughs> Yeah, and so there's there's definitely not much use in having everyone just sort of dreaming yes, exactly. <laughs> about a, a wonderful world that doesn't translate into into action. And this is where I think we we have institutional gaps. And again, it's maybe relevant to the R, RCA. So one of the fields that I've been keen on in, in for quite a few years is sometimes called social R and D. We have fantastic systems for doing research and development on vaccines or new aircraft or new you know, electric vehicles, but we're much worse at doing that around social phenomena. And in the last few years, there's been a sort of spread of practice around social R&D, particularly in, in Canada, which has now integrated a bit into parts of government around like employment. And in Australia last month, I was part of a, we did a, a, a big event with universities and designers on you know, what a social R&D lab would look like. And one of the, the hosts of that was an organization I was involved in creating about 10 or 12 years ago there called Family by Family, which came out of the Australian Center for Social Innovation. And in many ways was an example of design method in, in practice because it came out of a project working with families really struggling who were at risk of being pulled into the court system. Mm. I'm out of that and out of the real engagement with the users, as it were, and lived experience came a new organization called Family by Family, which mobilized families to help other families like them in a, in a horizontal way. And that's been very successful, is now spread all over uh, all over Australia. It's been adopted in parts of uh, of Europe. But it was done in this iterative, experimental way, refining its 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 methods and turning in some ways quite a, a big, bold vision of, uh, of, you know, sort of saving thousands and thousands of families from yeah. disaster <laughs> uh, and actually making a difference. And the woman who ran the project then became head of the organization and now is the, the great champion of social R&D across Australia with a fantastic team of people who are exactly, as Serge's question sort of says, finding ways to link some ways quite bold, radical vision to very practical action in the present on the ground. Fantastic example. Thank you very much for, for sharing such such examples. Um, I love I love the expression social r and I'm learning a lot about Canada. This is great. Um, there's so many technological. I know we've talked about technology before and you mentioned things like heat pumps before. But again, we can do all the things that that put these into place, like legislation and, and incentives, even, you know, have five thousand pounds off your heat pumps, just moving this back to sort of more tangible and technological changes that are coming. But, you know, trying to explain to my grandparents that they can't just go and turn the thermostat up anymore. You know, is that kind of very small behavioral social impact of this of this stuff? Um, but big tech governments, organizations don't dial that in at the beginning of their discussions, do they? They tend to march off down the, the big guns of change, forgetting the tiny little bits that might be massive barriers to that. I, I mean, I think what you're saying is we need to have these collaborative ventures bring in the social R&D thinking into those as well. Is that going to be easy? What do we need to do to make sure that happens? Well, the reason I gave that example is we don't, in, certainly in the UK and in most countries, have any institutions which do social R&D. We spend enormous amounts of money on classic hardware R&D, <laughs> but almost nothing on this. So it's, it's not really surprising. Uh, it's much harder to do. So let me just give one very, very live example. Um, 
in the midst of an energy crisis, energy prices have gone through the roof. I'm wearing thick clothes because I turned my heating off uh, in my home. Now, I think many neighborhoods like my street would quite like to see what we could learn from each other, what we could do, how we could observe the data, perhaps, of how we were using energy, what our options would be for changing it. Smart meters, in principle, change that a bit at the individual level, but none of us own that data. We have no scope as a community for owning, sharing, using our energy usage data, using that to train machine learning algorithms to help us organize energy in different ways. The data is entirely locked up within the electricity companies. The same is true in pretty much every country. And so a whole set of technological possibilities which depend on pooling data, training algorithms are blocked in terms of the digital side of net zero because of, uh, say, a, a structural uh, problem of, of, of proprietary data. Now, that's one example where, you know, it's not that hard to imagine a social R&D program encouraging, you know, 100 neighborhoods to have license to use the data in different ways, to change their ways of working, uh, to maybe see if they can negotiate better deals with the electricity companies, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what I think we should be doing alongside, not as an alternative to, you know, refining heat pumps or, um, yeah. uh, or, or batteries, but as the complement to them, because so much of becoming a, an ecologically mature civilization depends as exactly as you were saying on on human psychology and consciousness and 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 habits as much as on the big ticket uh, hardware technologies very good i've got an associated question um from uh one of my senior tutors on the service design mm -hmm. course john sun uh, a nicely provocative one i think um the ai discussion encapsulates the neoliberal stance that is that is raged against what might be seen as more gentle envisionings of the future. People can pour their heart and soul into more equitable, caring, regenerative ideas and structures, and they are overridden by profit principles and lack of support. How can we make sure that visions that don't emanate from dreams of individual power, I wonder who they're talking about, but from a sense of developing equitable systems are prioritized? Yeah, well, I think I largely agree with the thrust of that question. And the example I just gave, I, I hope, shows that. Mm. Um, in relation to AI and data, there's we often polarise in into a rather over-the-top sort of enthusiasm. They'll solve everything, uh, mainly in the hands of business. And then a mirror reaction, which says this is all a, a plot, a conspiracy, a big brother or big capitalism. What I was describing was actually a, a different alternative where that kind of data, like about energy usage, is pooled, is shared, is, is ideally run by a, some kind of trust or mutual, not either profit maximizing or the state as it would be in, in China. And the same applies in so many fields like health, I mentioned earlier, care for the elderly, where we're missing the institutions, middle level institutions, which can be the guardians of social and public value in relation to data and AI. I've been banging on about this for years and years and haven't, to be honest, made a huge amount of progress. But I think I think we're, we, I hope, reaching the point where we move beyond this kind of, say, polarized and often not very constructive argument uh, yeah. towards uh, an to actually designing practical alternatives and showing how they might work. There's quite a few cities across Europe now working on this in relation to, uh, to, to data, but this is where we need people like you to actually be fleshing out the detail. How would these work? What might be the problems? How would they, who would pay for it? You know, what would be the privacy protections? It's, it has to become practical quite quickly, but certainly my, my picture of a future capitalism is one where you do have a very dynamic competitive market, but you also have much stronger uh, social institutions uh, managing all sorts of things from uh, public spaces to, to data. Yes, fantastic. Thank you again for such brilliant examples. Um, we've got so many questions, lots of very design orientated questions, as you might expect. But um, and I think you're answering them uh, in, in various uh, ways as we talk. Um, there's one here. Oh, sorry. Someone's just asked a question. It's moved from my uh, panel. Here we go. Uh, so this one you mentioned briefly, and of course the RCA is famous for creating 
the school of design around speculative and this is back to how do we think about future how do we envision our future so in terms of imagining alternative thank you tj chen by the way in terms of imagining alternative future jeff mentioned rca tradition of speculative approach uh, there's even the specific type of design called speculative design. The future they pictured was wild. <laughs> However, in what way do you think this ability of picturing future, the future may express its potentiality, its power or influence in what position in industry, in politics, whatever? You know, is that a useful thing, thinking crazily out in the future, that sort of speculative way? I mean, I think there is definitely is a is a place for that. And in in the book, I try to describe quite a lot of the methods there are out there to use, including speculative design, speculative fiction, world building, which is what Hollywood does to sort of create a coherent, you know, sci-fi uh, uh, um, picture. And there's also things like museums of the future, which are really only just starting at the moment. In in Dubai, the Museum of the Future opened last year, and I think is now the most popular tourist attraction in Dubai and you know was an attempt to create physical installations experiences to help people uh think ahead I'm told there are now at 35 museums of the future in a loose wow. network um in the UK we have I think 3,000 museums but not a single museum of the future they're all museums <laughs> of the past so I think we do need places which are curated which use design to imagine but ideally imagining not just the physical objects which are prompts for thinking in a different way, but which can also represent, as I said earlier, different relationships, different ways of thinking and feeling and, and seeing, which I think are the complement to the objects. So basically my answer to your question is, yes, we actually need much more of that and with a richer array of, of methods and of public spaces to engage everything from primary school kids to the elderly in that, that exercise of really blowing apart your assumptions about what what the world might look like in the future i love that and by the way just to advertise the book even further there are two brilliant appendixes at the back one's a rough theory of social imagination and the other um some prompts for imagination so terrific sort of backup reading there as well um so at the end of the day what does success look like jeff what does what chances have we got for for being more imaginative about our social and political future? You mentioned it takes a long time. Um, how long is it going to take, and what success? What might success look like over the next decades, maybe? Well, part part of the pleasure in writing the book was looking at history, and looking at the times in the past when people had perhaps had a, a stronger sense of social imagination and it was more present in the culture. Uh, and in those examples, much of the 19th century, it was present in fiction and utopias, which were bestsellers. It was present in political movements like the Chartists, whose demands in 1848, one of the biggest marches ever in the UK's history, they took 80 years to be realized, but they were ultimately uh, realized, or the creation of model towns and model places, which has been a very interesting strand where design and social imagination connect from Robert Owen's New Lanark in the 1820s, which showed in reality what cooperation cooperatives could look like. And there's now 300 million people working co-ops worldwide through to some of the more corporate model towns, the garden cities of the late 19th century and their equivalents in the eco towns now in the in the 2020s. So I think we need all of these different sort of strands to be cultivated from the, the purely as a way fictional artistic through to the very everyday. And as I say, every town or city, I think should have at least one museum of the future, which people go to. And finally, we need dialogue. So I think we need political leaders who can um, uh, organize, mobilize, national debates about, for example, what should our care system look like in 20, 30 years time? And what do we need to do now to get there? It won't be fixed overnight. It's got huge problems. But without that kind of shared ownership of the problem and of the solutions, we're much less likely to end up with a care system which, you know, which which will serve us well. And 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 the good thing I think about the 2020s is in some ways the big problems are fairly obvious and not actually that much argued about. I think 
all the main parties and certainly most of the democracies see the achievement of net zero, dealing with aging and care, um, dealing with inequality, dealing with the problems of democracy and mistrust. You know, these are the, the unavoidable big issues of our time. What we're missing is the imaginative energy to really grapple with them. And as I say, to connect a horizon, a longer horizon, which may be several decades out to what that means for action now in 2023 and four. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, it, it's very infectious, your positivity, which I'm enjoying very much. At the end of the book, you talk, you have a quote from um, Purgatory by Dante, uh, who imagines himself transformed into a tree pointing to the stars, remade as new trees are renewed when they bring forth new boughs. I was pure and prepared to climb into the stars. On that, uh, on that basis, what, what, what advice, what um, encouragement would you give to many of the designers and young design students, of course, at the RCA who are listening to this, to this talk? What would be your advice to them as we uh, come towards the end of our session? Well, maybe just there's three or four things. One, in a way, is what you said earlier, Clive. I think the more you can go out and find, talk to, see the places and people who are trying to create a better future, and there are millions of them around the world, they're in any place, any city, their energy and optimism is infectious, even if what they're doing isn't exactly the blueprint for the future. But I think if you're not doing that, it's quite hard to remain engaged. Do read poetry, do read Dante. I think you know, the arts, the reason I wrote this other book on the arts is they play such a vital role in opening up our minds, stopping us becoming tram blind in our, in our ways of thinking. Then get into practice if you can, if you can in your own work, be engaged in the prototypes, the pilots, the projects, which could in a sense, some ways create a line of sight between now uh, and and the future and then finally connect because there always will be uh, and this is what I find both the excitement and the frustration of being in the 2020s for anything you're doing there will be thousands of people around the world doing something similar but despite Google it's quite hard to find them <laughs> and it's quite hard to connect and create a shared movement so when yeah. you do make mistakes and you inevitably will when there are failures and there inevitably will be failures you can share that with others and they can help you get out the other side because it can be quite lonely being a, a a pioneer and a prototyper and we all need others to help us along on the journey yes fantastic thank you thank you jeff i think that's that's absolutely brilliant advice of course, I could always advise people to come and study service design, where we're the one course we give you a higher mark when you fail than when you succeed. So <laughs> um, we're nearly at the end of this session. I know there are some fantastic questions. Thank you. There's so many of them. Um, and a lot of them are, are very much from designers pleading sort of, what do we do? What do we do? But I'm, I don't think we're going to get into that detail. We haven't got much enough time to do that. But I, I personally have found Jeff's advice incredibly practical as well as being visionary and inspirational. I hope you agree with me. Jeff, thank you so much for talking to us. It's been a fantastic pleasure. And um, by the comments that are coming through, um, you've all enjoyed it out there as well. I have to say a huge thank you to everybody around the world. What was it, over 50 different countries who've joined us today? And I'm sure there'll be lots more people watching the recording of this uh because you haven't been able to make it uh we'll be pushing this out i'm sure pretty sure we will be um so thank you again everybody but finally thank you jeff for taking part of this good luck with everything you do i'm looking forward to reading your new book as soon as it comes out but just remind everybody published by hearst another world is possible and we look forward to seeing you again on another in session talk thank you all very much and thank you clive and, and joe and the rca uh thank you uh Clive, and thank you, Jeff, both for sharing your insights and expertise. And I would like to thank our audience, everyone who joined us for today's in session talk. If uh, you have any additional questions or you would like to connect directly with the executive education team and the speakers, you can reach out directly using the contact information on this slide. And make sure to check our web page for upcoming in session talks. We have more lined up. Uh, in the spring and also uh, please join our upcoming online short course led by Clive in in May 
Uh, thank you for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye, everybody.